Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to Dewsbury Evangelical Church's morning worship service. Uh, welcome to those online. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone here, especially if you're a guest and, and if you're perhaps not familiar with how church goes. Let me just say, um, we, we come and we pray to God. We sing songs to God, we read God's word, and the main chunk of the, 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 uh, the service is preaching God's word uh, for about half an hour. So that's what we'll be doing this morning. And then afterwards, uh, we're having fellowship lunch. So if you've not um, um, been uh, decided to come or you weren't planning on coming, don't worry, there should be enough food for all of us. Uh, so I, I made at least two more sandwiches than I normally make. So uh, if you can stay, stick around, that would be great. We come, don't we, and we worship in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we want to listen to his word. We want to hear what he says. And so we're going to start just by reading a few words from the New Testament from a book uh, called Ephesians, which is uh, a book that Paul wrote a letter to a church in Ephesus, uh, these wonderful words. Uh, Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms of every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his uh, will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That's a, a dense passage with amazing truths about Christ and, well, about the triune God saving us through Christ. Uh, and there's a little uh, uh, refrain in this passage that, that says, to the praise of his glorious grace, or something like that. And Paul is basically breaking, in, in between uh, describing the wonders of the gospel, he can't help but praise God as a result. And so we've just read this wonderful passage, we're now going to praise God as a result. In fact, we're going to uh, sing a song based on this passage, Come Praise and glorify. If you're willing and able, join me in standing to praise our God. Yeah, 
sit. Let's come and pray to our God together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the wondrous gospel that we've just read about, we've just sung about, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his life, death, and resurrection. Lord, we come before you this morning, uh, perhaps uh, with uh, fears, with difficulties, with struggles, and some of us are perhaps coming uh, before you this morning, uh, perhaps not used to coming to church, or perhaps you, we've come every, day, every Sunday for the last 20, 30 years. Lord, whoever we are this morning, would you speak to us and show us your truth in your words? Help us to see the wonders of Christ. Lord, help us to realize just what it meant, just what it means for Christ to die for us, to take our sins, to take our punishment. Help us to realize that he did that to save us and help us to, as a result, turn to Christ, follow Christ and praise you, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we come uh, perhaps with uh, sins that we have committed this week, things that we know have, are wrong, Lord, and yet we've chosen to do them anyway. Lord, we thank you that Christ's blood, Christ's sacrifice means we are forgiven of those sins. And we come to you confessing them now, knowing you are a God that is a God of forgiveness, a God of grace, a God who gives his undeserved love and kindness to us. So Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning. Help us, help us to see more of you, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to say a, a confession together. Sometimes we do this in church. It's good to uh, corporately confess our sins, to, to, uh, to say together uh, that we are sinners, we've been sinful, and that we need to rest upon Christ's grace and his mercy. So we're going to say this together. Heavenly Father, you are the impartial judge of all people. You called us to be holy as you are holy. Forgive us that we easily drift back into an empty way of life. Forgive us that we still conform to evil desires, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Thank you that you have redeemed us with the precious blood of Jesus, and you have given us a living hope in him. Please help us to live our lives with reverent fear. Help us to love one another deeply from the heart and help us to grow up in our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me read a, a few more verses from Ephesians 1. We finished in verse 10. Let me read on from verse 11. And Paul continues, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And if your mind has just been blown, you don't fully understand that, then that's because this is huge. But he goes on, In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. It's, uh, again, wonderful truth, isn't it? And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the role of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life as we continue our series in Galatians. We've got to the point of, in chapter 5, on the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's really important to, to just remind ourselves that, the, that we, we have marked in Him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit. 
who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. He is guaranteeing that we'll be saved until we inherit what, what, what we have been promised to have, the new heavens and the new, hev- uh, the new earth and the new heavens when Christ returns. Again, these are massive things. These are huge, amazing truths. And that's why we praise God. That's why we worship him, which is what we're going to do now again. We're going to sing a couple of songs. Uh, We're going to sing a song, O Great Gods. And then we're going to sing a song that is also a prayer, Holy Spirit, living breath of God. So let's sing together. Thank you. 
Our children, it's time for the children's talk. So if you want to come and sit on these wonderfully colored little chairs at the front, and I think Rachel will be doing the talk this morning. Come and sit down. Find yourself a nice colored seat. Come on, Ariel. I've got someone for you to meet here. Someone new. <laughs> Hello, Abigail. Oh. <laughs> it's taking a long time this morning, isn't it? It's like me getting up on a Sunday morning. It takes a long time. <laughs> right then. Okay. So I wasn't here last week. Who was? Who was here last week? You don't know. Well, I know that Uncle Alan was sat here last week and he had a bag of things. Can you remember anything he had in that bag? Animals? And birds and fish. Birds, fish? Did he have one of these? No. Marion, can I have it, please? This is Marion, Maz for short. She has a friend called Bob. Some of you adults might know why she's called Maz and her friend is called Bob. I'll let you think about that. <laughs> I think Mark will know. Bob and Maz? Bob, Bob, right. Yes, well, this is Maz. She's, she's named after our esteemed friend who is with the Lord now in glory. There they go. <laughs> Mark's grandma. Yes, Mark's grandma. Okay, so this is Maz. And... Uh, I really want her to give me this flower, but she, she won't give it to me, will she? And what does she look like? She's covering her eyes. What's the matter with her? She's shy. She's shy, isn't she? Sometimes you feel very shy when you come to the front, don't you? And you don't always want to sit here and you worry that somebody's going to ask you a question and you're not going to know the answer. I think Maz might be worried. Does she need to be worried? No. What could we do to, cheer, to make her feel like she can be part of us? You don't know. Well, what would you do if you saw somebody feeling sad and scared and worried? What might you do to help them, Ezra? Was that your hand up? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll come on to that in a minute. Well, I'll tell you what I might do. I might give her a big smile. Can you do that? Oh, she might be peeping now. And what about giving her a wave? Can you wave? Thank you, Maz. Thank you. Are these boys and girls? Are these boys and girls you told me about? Yes, they are, Maz. They are. And we're going to tell them today about flowers and the great God who made them. Are you ready to listen, Maz? Are the boys and girls ready to listen? Are you ready to listen? Okay. Now then, I think Uncle Alan brought a flower out last week out of his bag. And what did he tell you about the things he brought out of his bag? Who made these things? God. God did, yes. God designed all these things and made them. And he ma with flowers, he makes them grow. Does anybody know how he makes them grow? Water, yeah, he sends the rain. And what else does he send? He's sending quite a lot of rain and quite a lot of something else at the moment. 
Storms, yes, right, well, yeah. <laughs> what, what else? Water and sunshine. Thank you. Yes, that's right. So God makes the sunshine and the, the rainfall and the flowers grow beautiful. There's been some beautiful flowers at the moment. I was in Shrewsbury yesterday and the day before, and we went to the park in Shrewsbury, and it was full of beautiful, beautiful flowers. And you know, the Bible is a wonderful book. It's God's Word to us. And God, in his Word, talks about flowers, would you believe? He tells us about all sorts of things he's created to teach us about him. In fact, the Bible tells us that even if we haven't heard God's word or read it, some of us can't read yet, can we? We can see some of God's qualities, his amazing qualities, by looking at the world he created. And flowers are part of that world. So... Maz, you were a bit worried at the beginning, weren't you? Yes, I was very worried. I was very worried, children, but now I feel a bit better. What, why were you worried? Can we have the sl first slide, Deborah? Okay. I was worried that you wouldn't like me. Okay, oh, but that's not true, is it? You like Maz. Do you know, boys and girls, and mums and dads, we do a lot of worrying, don't we? We worry about things. Thanks, John. I meant to do that. We worry about a lot of things. And you know what the Lord Jesus said to a big group of people amongst whom there would have been many worriers, many shy people, many uh, people who were worried about their future. They were worried about where they'd get the next meal from. They were worried about all sorts, and we worry about all sorts. And the Lord Jesus said to them, why do you worry about what you will eat and what you will wear? Consider how the flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not one, uh, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Now Solomon was a king. He was a king and he would have dressed in fine robes. And if we'd have seen Solomon, we'd have thought, oh, wow. And we would have thought we needed to bow down. But, you know, even Solomon in his fine robes wasn't as beautiful as flowers are. And God made those flowers. And that tells us something about God. Not just that he's big and great in creating things, but he also makes things beautiful. And he himself, boys and girls, is beautiful. Um, so, I want you to remember when you are out and about and you see flowers that a great God made those flowers, he designed those flowers, he looks after them, and he says, we don't need to worry about our worries like we do, because he knows what we need. He looks after the flowers, and he knows, he made us too, he knows what we need, and he will look after us. Now then, I am going to show you a video now. You're going to watch it, Maz? Yes. I'm going to show a little video for the mums and dads and the boys and girls to look at some wonderful flowers. Now you look at these flowers, you can look at that screen or look up there. Can we have the lights out please? And let's see how wonderful God is to make things like this, to design them. It's wonderful.
That was a close-up look at beautiful flowers. I think Maz was happy to see all that. Are you happy about that? Flowers make people happy, you know. No, they think they Yeah, so next time you see the flowers, boys and girls, think about how our amazing God and how he made things beautiful and how he looks after the flowers yeah. and tells us the flowers don't need to worry so nor do you because i love you i made you and i will look after you you ready to say bye bye to maz bye you might see her again someday <laughs> okay you can go and sit down now thanks for thanks rach the next Britain Got Talent contestant, I think. Um, I never call my grandma Maz. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If everybody knows all the names of those flowers as well, you get a prize at the end. A free lunch. Um, we're going to come to God's words. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, please open them to Galatians. We're, we're in our series in Galatians. Um, we've got, after this one, two more left. As we said, we're in chapter 5. Uh, and I just want to, as, as Mike comes and reads this, try and spot what's beautiful in this passage. There's, there's something wonderful in this passage, really beautiful in this passage. So Mike is going to come up and read to us Galatians 5, 16 to 25. It was always Mr. and Mrs. Proctor. <laughs> Let's read. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh, sorry, for what the flesh desires, what is contrary to the Spirit, and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Thank you, Mike. We're going to be looking at that passage, as I said, uh, in a sh shortly. But before we do, and before the children leave for uh, Bible Explorers, we're going to sing again. Uh, again, it's a song that can be sung as a prayer. Uh, prepare our hearts, uh, show us Christ. You just have the first verse up, Deborah. Um, prepare our hearts, O God, help us to receive. Break the hard and stony ground, help our unbelief. Plant your word down deep in us, cause it to bear fruit. Open up our ears to hear. Leaders in your truth. Shall we sing? 
together. sit. Jordan, if you want to go to Bible Explorers now, who's, who's leading today? Ian. Looks like Ian is leading Ian and Beth. As they're going, it would be really helpful if you do have a Bible to open it to Galatians 5. I think it's always easier to follow along uh, if you've got the Bible out in front of you. Uh, there will be a, a PowerPoint as well to just help with the direction of where we're going this morning. Let me pray before we we get going. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that opens up our eyes to the truths of your word. We pray now that you would help us to concentrate, Lord, help us to see, perhaps anew or afresh, the truths in this passage. Speak to us, challenge us, encourage us. Show us more of Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So uh, Eric gets home from work and he's tired. He's feeling sorry for himself because of a hard week at work. His boss has been an idiot all week. He's got to the end of the week, and in order to make himself feel better, he, he opens his laptop and he types in a website address that he knows he shouldn't type. And he pauses before pressing enter. Uh, there's something quietly telling him not to do it, something reminding him not to go there, somebody reminding him that this is wrong. But then there's a, there's a louder, seductive, self-congratulating voice telling him, it's okay, go for it, do it, click it. Uh, Harriet is on a lunch break and has met up with a friend, Simon, who's just really angry about uh, their group of friends. He's, he's frothing at the mouth with rage. And to a degree, he, he, you understand why. He, his his mum has just died recently and none of his friends have asked him how he's doing. And Harriet, she, she understands and she's just about to lay into one particular mutual friend when she stops. Uh, there's an overwhelming sense of wrongness, uh, the temptation to badmouth this friend, to rip into her all, about all kinds of annoying things. It's really strong, but she knows to do so is unkind. It's, it's wrong. Uh, this week, we're looking at this reality as Christians that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. And if you aren't a Christian here this morning, that you just need to know that there is a reality that is a spiritual reality. That, that this world isn't just a world uh, uh, of material things. There is a spiritual dimension to life. Uh, one writer says, Our hearts are battlefields engaged in a war between two opposing spiritual forces. And Paul, he puts it like this, doesn't he, in verse 17 of Galatians 5. He says, uh, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. See, the heart, and when the Bible talks about the heart, it's, it's not the, 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 the thing pumping blood in, in our bodies right now. It's a, it's a poetical term to describe the, the control center of our personality who we are, and our hearts are engaged in a daily war, a daily struggle, a daily conflict between our old sinful nature, that's what Paul describes as the flesh here in this passage, and our new spirit-fueled nature. And each day, each hour, we make decisions based on how much influence our old sinful nature has over us, or we make decisions based on how much we are influenced by the direction of God's spirit dwelling inside of us. And this morning, we're, we're looking at Galatians, uh, this passage, and we're going to once again ask the question that we asked last week. Uh, how, how do we live out this freedom that we have now in Christ? Because Paul, in, in the passage in chapter 5 and verse 1 that we looked at last week, said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ has, has, has saved us for a life of freedom. So what does that life of freedom look like? Well, we, we began to answer it last week, and we're, we're continuing to answer it this week, and we could answer it perhaps by saying this, freedom looks like the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, not the flesh. Walking by the Spirit, not our sinful nature. But of course, it's also acknowledging we're in a spiritual battle. It's going to be hard, and it's ongoing. So this morning, uh, we're going to ask three questions. Uh, we're going to ask, how do I win this war? It's always helpful, isn't it, to know how we win the war. Uh, then we're going to see what does defeat look like. And then we're going to see what does victory look like. So let's ask that first question. How do I win this war? And, and well, of course, we have to start by answering you don't. Uh, after all, it was Christ who set you free, verse 1 of chapter 5. He, he was the one that saved you. It was his death that liberated you from the guilt of sin. And Paul has been saying again and again in Galatians that you are justified by faith, not works. That, that is, you're declared not guilty by faith in Jesus Christ, not by your own effort. And once we're saved, that, that doesn't change as we seek to become like Christ. Although we are, we're not passive spectators, there's a battle. And although, and although victory, total victory won't happen until Christ returns, it is very obvious that our growth in the Christian life, our maturity in the Christian life, is entirely dependent upon the Spirit at work in us. As one writer says, the Spirit is the controlling influence 
in our lives. Or as a, another older writer, you might have heard him called Lufus, says the spirit is the captain of our lives. He is our leader. He is the one directing us. And so when it comes to the war between our sin and the spirit inside of us, we need to ask this question. Who is more influential in shaping me? You know, this world is a world of influencers, isn't it? Probably heard of influencers. You can even ask the question, even if you're not a Christian here this morning, who is the thing or what is the thing that morally influences me more than anything else? Where, where, do, I, where do I get the idea of good and wrong from? What shapes me? Well, here's four things to help us be more influenced by the Spirit rather than sin. To walk by the wisdom and truth of the Spirit. And the first thing is this. Live by the Spirit, Paul says in verse 16. He says, doesn't he? So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Literally, and actually on the, on the passage there, it said, didn't it? Walk by the Spirit. That Live by the Spirit is literally walk by the Spirit. Walk by the wisdom and truth of the Spirit, not the wisdom and lies of this age. Look, the Bible is incredibly realistic about the Christian life. There is conflict. If you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for I don't know how many years, or even for a few months, you'll know that there is conflict. That conflict in verse 17 that Paul talks about means we cannot do whatever we want, which means we cannot just be neutral in this war because our actions will betray our allegiance one way or another. However, despite the, the fact that the Bible is incredibly realistic, that there is, there is struggles in the Christian life, it isn't fatalistic. Because here Paul says in verse 16, live by the Spirit, and if you do this, if you follow the Spirit's direction, if the Spirit is influencing you in your life, then you will not turn to sin. You see, these aren't two equally opposing forces I don't know if you think that. If you do, you're wrong. The spirit inside of you is stronger than the sin fighting against you. Do you believe that this morning? The spirit inside you is stronger than the sin fighting against you. There is hope in this war against sin. Uh, years and years ago now, I um, did a study on the morale of soldiers in the First World War. Uh, it was fascinating. If you want to know more uh, later, come and talk to me about it. But one of the, one of the things, because so, some of you will bore you to death, but, but what, one of the things that I, I saw in this study was that the, 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 the main factor for a soldier to keep on fighting against all the odds, and there's plenty of factors, but the main factor to, for him to not to give up is having hope. Having hope of victory. Having hope that they will not lose. Because without hope... Well, it's so easy to give up, isn't it? And maybe some of you here have just given up in fighting against sin. And if that is you, can I say there is, there is hope this morning if you're a Christian. Don't give up. Remember, Christ has saved you from the guilt and penalty of sin. And the Spirit has been given to you to influence you so that you don't fall under the power or you could say the spell of sin in your life. And if you want to know what that looks like a little bit, well, it looks like not gratifying our sinful desires. The seductive, addictive, whispering desire for you to sin. So each day, each hour, rely on the Spirit's help. Walk by the Spirit, which can be said in another way, be led by the Spirit. Uh, if you just look at verse 18, that's what Paul says again. He says, be led by the Spirit. You, you're influenced by the Spirit, so no longer, and you no longer belong to the old era of the law that condemns. Now the Spirit has been sent. You're influenced by the Spirit, so be led by the Spirit's work inside of you. And this is possible because our sinful nature has been crucified. Just turn with me to verse 24. Uh, Paul writes in verse 24, just a little bit further down in our passage, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does it look like when the Spirit is the controlling influence in our lives? It looks like repentance. 
We have crucified our sinful nature with its passions and desires, which is just a fancy way of saying repentance, turning away from sin, killing sin by turning to Christ, by belonging to Christ. Now, the language implies this is painful, and yet it is necessary. And it reminds us of something that Paul wrote earlier in Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 20. Maybe some of you, it's your favorite verse. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I've nailed my sin to the cross of Christ. I've pledged my allegiance to Jesus. I've repented of my sin and deny myself and pick up my cross. And now I follow Christ, and by his Spirit, who lives in me, I follow him. It's, it's describing the wonderful transformation and reality of the Christian life. And verse 24 reminds us that sin has, has been defeated, even if it's not been totally been killed. Uh, you could say that the fight against sin is the fight against a bandit on the road. When we're walking along the road, sin is that bandit who's no longer in control of the city, but he's going to do everything he can to hurt you. And we can keep this bandit at bay if, fourthly, we keep in step with the Spirit, verse 25. Paul says, doesn't he, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's another way of saying, walk by the Spirit. Since we're Spirit-fueled Christians who are given the Spirit to help us, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's, It's actually a word sometimes used in military contexts back in the time. To say, keep in line, march in step with the Spirit's values and truths. Do we keep in step with the Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit the one influencing us? Are we walking by the Spirit in this war? Because that's how we win. But what does defeat look like? What does defeat look like? What does it look like to allow the desires of your sinful nature to control you and influence you? Well, Paul lists... uh, 15 vices here in verses 90 to 21, and he starts by saying that these are obvious. You know, because when it comes down to it, the contrast is so sharp, we should know the difference between what defeat looks like and what victory looks like. (laughs) Yeah? Anybody can see that difference. It's like knowing the difference between night and day, knowing the difference between what is good and what is bad. And defeat looks like any one of these particular sins controlling you and influencing you, where you choose these things daily without repentance, without turning from them and turning back to Jesus. And, and, and that these are the things that are influencing you. And it's a warning. Paul is warning us this morning. He states in verse 21, if you live like this, it's, it's a huge warning. If you live like this, if these sins define you, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's how serious it is. If you're not, if you're living a life, this is really important. If you're living a life of unrepentant, continual sin, then you're not a Christian. Just be careful of what I say in those words. If you're living a life of unrepentant, continual sin, you're not a Christian. Jesus isn't Lord of your life. Sin is. And these aren't an exhaustive list of sins, by the way. Uh, Verse 21, Paul just finishes with this casual kind of phrase, and the like. (laughs) Uh, So if if your particular sin that you're struggling with isn't on this list, you're not off the hook. (laughs) No, these sins, you could say, represent the various categories of sin, like, for example, sexual sin in verse 19. Uh, representing sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Uh, Making sex into a god and worshipping it by letting sex just dominate you, imparting from the biblical reality of sex being between, in the framework of marriage between a man and his wife. Um, Back in Paul's day in Galatia, uh, (laughs) sex was a massive thing. Because they were influenced by the Roman and Greek culture. Any man could have sex with anyone they liked if they were powerful enough. They didn't need even to have much money to sleep with a prostitute. The the cheapest prostitute cost the the price of a loaf of bread. And if you were a man and you had had means, then you could just do what you wanted. And and it it probably shows that actually in in Latin, there's no uh, word for the male virgin. 
but there's 25 words for prostitute in Latin. <laughs> Sex was massive back in Paul's day. It dominated the culture just as it dominates us. And to abuse it is to fall into sin. To worship it is to fall into sin. But not all sin is a sexual nature. Sometimes I think the church gets a little bit too... Uh, it, all, all sin is sexual. We can, we can sometimes fall into that trap. But no, Paul continues and says, well, we've got to watch out for the supernatural sin. What I've said called the supernatural sin in verse 20 of idolatry and witchcraft. You get, get why I've, I've named it that? Uh, just kind of delving into the, the supernatural and not worshipping God. So after all, the fundamental reality of sin is worshipping something other than God and depending upon something other than God. That's the, that's the fundamental reality of what sin is. So don't let created things be more influential in your life than the creator God. Don't fall into idolatry and witchcraft. Uh, we could say lots more about this. I'm, I'm zooming along at a, at a fast pace. Uh, let's, let's continue and look at the next set of sins, which I think are a bit more relevant to us, relational sins. In verse 20 to 21, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Uh, Considering Paul has just emphasized the need to serve one another humbly and love in verse 13, and then emphasized the love of your neighbor in verse 14, it should not be a surprise that Paul's list is dominated by sins that break and hurt and damage and destroy relationships. No no doubt it was a problem within the Galatian churches who were probably struggling with who to believe and whether to follow uh, the false teachers of Paul. And and, and so relationships were broken as a result. And it's still a problem today, of course, isn't it? Do any one of these relational sins define you this morning? you struggle with this morning? But we must also be aware of the last category as well, the category of overindulgent sin in verse 21, of drunkenness and orgies, which orgies probably should be translated more like wild parties, not orgies. It's, it's not necessarily having that, that sexual um, connotation. It's, it's really it, more that, that kind of just wild partying, just partying in excess taking a good thing and overindulging in it, having it to the excess. Too much of a good thing can be a bad influence and is sinful. When was the last time you overindulged? These and more sins like them are the acts of the flesh. These are what it looks like to be losing the war by by surrendering to sin. These are, you could say, the weeds that grow on our heart, that squeeze our life the life out of us. And we need to be uh, doing our best to avoid them, to kill them, to turn away from them toward the Spirit, because the Spirit should be, if we're Christians here this morning, the controlling influence in our lives. We should be walking by the Spirit. We need to live by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, repent and keep in step with the Spirit. And if we do this, if we do this, we produce fruit. So what does victory look like? Victory looks like the fruit of the Spirit. Victory against the power of sin. See, the victory against the penalty of sin was won by Christ at the cross. But the victory against the power of sin in our lives, the ever-present power of sin in our lives, looks like fruit of the Spirit. You know, I think the metaphor of fruit is so helpful for the Christian life because it implies, first of all, growth can be slow. Uh, So if you know a Christian and they don't look like they've got these ones, then it, it might just be that they growth slow, isn't it? I, uh, I planted a raspberry cane in my garden a couple of months ago, and for some reason, raspberries didn't just appear. Uh, but, but it's growing. I can see that it's grown, but I'm going to have to wait until at least next year for the raspberries to appear. I think it's such a helpful metaphor to to grab hold of. Uh, Secondly, also because growth can be seasonal. 
Uh, sometimes you'll see good fruit, but other times you, when you allow the weeds of sin to grow in your heart, you, you won't see as much fruit. You know, you have ups and downs, don't you, in the Christian life? Because here's how the imagery of fruit can help us. Our Christian maturity may look like slow seasonal growth plagued by the weeds of the enemy choking us and impeding growth. But each year, we grow a little bit bigger. We grow by keep identifying the weeds of sin around us and digging them up by the roots. And some weeds have deeper roots. I don't know if you've ever done any gardening. I got into gardening last year, and I had to, I had to dig up lots and lots of nettles. And those roots go deep. The network of roots go deep. You have to really dig and dig and dig. And as we dig... And as we keep on looking to the Spirit for help, we can grow. Uh, so far, I've not really addressed non-Christians here this morning. If you are a non-Christian, thank you for coming. I hope you've managed to kind of stay with us. Uh, and, and I want to just say this morning, whatever you think about Christianity, surely you can agree these things are things that you would want in your life to experience and to taste. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It would be, imagine a community with these characteristics. You'd want to be, you'd want to be a part of it, wouldn't you? Now, to a degree, you can have these things as a non-Christian, of course. It would be ludicrous to say that a non-Christian can't love or know joy. That's That's just silly. But the difference between experiencing these things is like seeing them in black and white or experiencing them in full HD. Because take God out of the picture, they become hollow reflections, distorted somewhat by sin. And the true beauty of the Christian life is to grow in this, this fruit of the Spirit, and we can know we are growing if we see these things in ourselves. Or perhaps, perhaps better if somebody sees them in us, because we can be very self-critical and blind at, at times. Uh, so if somebody sees these things in us, and there's nine elements, and the first one is love. It's no surprise that love is the first, because as we've said, Paul has emphasized the need for love throughout this chapter. In fact, earlier on in this chapter, in verse 6 of chapter 5, he says, the only thing that counts, the only thing that matters in this life is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts in life is faith in Jesus expressed through love. And it's a love for God, yes, but probably in context and in contrast to all those relational sins, it is a love for one another. Love is the dominant theme, or should be the dominant theme of the Christian life, followed closely by joy. Uh, One writer says, this joy depends not on circumstances, but on the spirit, and so may coexist with other feelings at times. Which is why Christians can still know joy even in all kinds of trials. Because take away everything, take away everything from the Christian, and the Christian still has the gospel. This is also why the fruit of the Spirit is peace. A peace that unifies rather than brings conflict. After all, the gospel of peace brought together in peace both Jew and Gentile. In fact, the God of peace gives us peace, reconciling uh, God and man. And then is, is worked out through our relationships with one another and through our struggles. That's why a Christian can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's a peace followed by forbearance, or you could say patience. It's the idea of long-suffering. We we still live in this present evil age, as Paul reminded us, right at the beginning beginning of Galatians. So there is suffering and there is struggle, and there are frustrations with life and people. We get that, don't we? I don't know what your week's been like, but I bet you've had some frustrations with life and people this week. But patience, patience, patience is what marks out a Christian walking by the Spirit. And patience that also shows kindness. Uh, This is a word often used to describe God's gracious response to us as rebels. 
and we in some small way, we image that kindness to others. Be kind is one of the cries of the world, isn't it? I don't know if you've got a top or a t-shirt with that on, be kind. It's what the world is crying out for. And it's a characteristic all Christians should have. A kindness that is closely related to goodness, having a, a degree of generosity in your actions, acting out of what is right and good toward one another, choosing to bless others through helping them. And alongside goodness, faithfulness. Yes, a faithfulness toward God, but also a faithfulness toward one another. What would it look like if you never broke your word? If you didn't let people down, Faithful people are also people displaying gentleness. So it's a word closely linked to humility. Having a humility, a gentleness. Now that's, imagine having gentleness on social media. <laughs> having a humility on social media. That's, that's one of the characteristics of a Christian, gentleness. And finally, finally, self-control. You can see how this is vital in order to fight against sin, don't you? We need not to give in to temptation, to, to not click that button like Eric did, at, uh, was tempted to do at the beginning, or start slandering someone as Harriet was tempted to do at the beginning. We need to have self-control. We need to practice self-control, because this is what victory looks like. What actually freedom looks like. A spirit-fueled life that reflects the spirit of Christ. It actually just reflects the life of Christ. Because after all, isn't this fruit seen perfectly in Christ? His love is seen in sacrifice. It's demonstrated by dying for us on the cross. What, what love is greater than this? If somebody should lay down their life for their friends. That's what Jesus did. Who, for the joy set before him endured the cross who is the one who gives peace. He is the true peacemaker. Who is the God-man patiently hung on the cross while being mocked and scorned by sinful humanity, by people he'd created. He, he patiently hung there. Who showed kindness and goodness in his life to so many. Who society had written off. And yet in his kindness and goodness, he healed and helped and talked to the sinners and outcasts. You see, Jesus didn't go to the rich and the powerful. He went to the poor and the helpless and showed goodness and kindness. And he was altogether faithful, even to the end. Even on the cross, he, he doesn't betray his father or us. He is faithful even unto death. A saviour who is altogether gentle. Uh, that word gentleness is the same word to describe him in Matthew 11 verse 29 when Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart. Come to me all you who are weary. Because he is gentle and lowly. If you want rest for your souls this morning, come to Jesus this morning. And finally, Jesus was the epitome of self-control, wasn't he? He never gave in to temptation. He never sinned. This is what victory looks like. Becoming more like our Savior. Victory over the power of sin is becoming more like our Savior who perfectly reflects these wonderful characteristics. Yes, we can't perfectly reflect them, but that's the, that's the aim, is to, to become more like Christ and reflect these characteristics so that we produce the fruit of the Spirit. This is the life we can live today as Christians by the power of the Spirit working inside of us. Yeah, not totally sinless, of course, but Spirit-influenced. So in the battle for our hearts, make sure it is the Spirit who is influencing you and directing you. And in this conflict, keep digging out the weeds of sin and keep looking to Jesus. And when you do that, you will grow in love. You will grow in joy. You will grow in peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, this is, on, this is what's on offer. 
if you turn to Jesus, if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from your sins and follow him. And as you walk this Christian life, as you walk, the growth is slow, the growth is seasonal, but you will look less like your old sinful self and more like Jesus in this world. Amen. We're going to sing a song uh, to help us perhaps just reflect on what we've heard. Uh, We're going to sing a song called We Trust in You, Our Shield and Our Defender. Let's sing together, shall we? on catch up this is the end of the service thank you very much for watching please uh, tune in again uh, next